You know, when uh, my girls were little, um, we used to watch a lot of Disney movies. I don't know if you guys with young kids still do that now, but we, we had a whole box just filled with VHS tapes of every Disney movie you can imagine. And I think one of our favorites was The Lion King. And um, it was one of our favorites because I think we just loved the story of Simba, this lion cub who is separated from really all that reminds him of his identity. Um, after Simba's father dies, he, he runs away from his home and from his family and from the responsibilities that he has. And he forsakes his true identity as a lion, as the king of beasts. And in his absence, the kingdom just falls apart. It's overrun by the forces of evil and becomes a dark and, and dying place. But then um, this baboon <laughs> priest named Rafiki finds Simba and really calls him back to his identity. And in John the Baptist-like fashion, Rafiki leads him up to a, a pool of water. And in that picture, you can see Simba looks into that pool and he sees his reflection. But not only that, he also sees the reflection of his father in that pool too. And so he realizes that his father is with him, that he's forever linked to his father. And the heavens open and his father speaks. Kind of sounds a little like Jesus' baptism, right? And so then um, what happens is at that moment, he's transformed. He understands his true identity as the Lion King, and he accepts the responsibilities that come with that identity. And then he's also empowered for the mission that lies before him. He's able to combat the forces of evil, and in the end, Simba is victorious, and he brings light and life back to the kingdom, right? Oops, spoiler alert. Anyway, you know. You've probably all seen it before, right? I think that movie has something to teach us about identity. And first of all, I think what it teaches us is we can often lose sight of our identity, just like Simba did. And because of that, the second thing that I think this Disney story teaches us is that we need to be reminded often about our true identity. And so that's what I want to talk about today, about identity. You know, your identity is so important. Think about how many times you're out and you have to show proof of your identity. You have to show some form of identification. Maybe it's at airport security or, you know, you're going to use a credit card or you go to the bank to do some banking or maybe you're picking up some medicine at the pharmacy. Maybe you're buying some alcohol. You know, they always card me, right? No. <laughs> that didn't come out right, but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Every blue moon when I go to buy alcohol, they card me, all right? Um, <laughs> um, I went back in January to um, get a new driver's license, one of those licenses that you can, um, that can serve as identification when you fly. And this is what I had to bring. I had to bring a picture ID, so my old um, driver's license. I had to bring two letters that were addressed to my address, to me. I had to bring my social security card, and I had to bring my birth certificate. Think about that, five forms of ID. And I understand with women, it's even more if you've been married and things like that. So our world is a world that's always um, a world in which we need to be identified. And your identi identity, it distinguishes you, uh, who you are from other people, and it also gives you a purpose and a direction for your life. And so I want to ask this question, who are you? And, and I really mean that. I want you to just chew on that for a second. Just sit back and think, you know, who are you? You know, so often we say, you know, I'm being true to myself. I'm being true to myself. Well, I wonder, how can you be true to yourself if you don't know who you are? And you know what? Even, even more, how can you be true to God if you don't know who you are, if you don't know your identity? On the cross, Jesus said, Father, 
forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know, the people who crucified Jesus, they were just trying to be themselves, right? Um, Judas, who betrayed Jesus, was trying to be true to himself, and yet what happened? They, they crucified God. It's a soul-searching question. Who are you? You know, to answer that question, what we often do is we often create our own identity, don't we? Which results in I'm being true to myself. We have these outside forces that, that often shape our identity. Maybe it's the media. Maybe it is commercials, self-help programs, or lifestyle magazines. And then this ever-changing world often causes us to reshape our identity. Think about the changes that happen in your, in your life and how they might affect your identity. Maybe a change of schools, or maybe it's a, it's a change of jobs, or a change of your marital status. It can affect your identity. Maybe it's, it's a change in your family structure. You, many of you know my daughter Kayla was just married in December, and so now I'm an empty nester, right? That's a little bit of a change for me and, and for my identity. So what happens is our identities often end up like a, a patchwork quilt, right? It's made up of many different shapes and brightly colored patches, right? And so we form our identities from a variety of different ways. Maybe it's from our relationships or from our occupation or from some past experiences that we had. Or we take a little bit from our parents to form our identity, a little bit from work, maybe a little bit from the media, maybe a little bit from the Bible, at least those parts we agree with, right? A little here, a little there, and we form our own identity, and our our lives end up resembling this patchwork quilt, you know, designed um, from whatever that we consider best for us, right? How can you be true to yourself, you know, um, without paying attention to only yourself, right? So we need to say, Father, forgive us, for we don't know what we do. We allow this ever-changing world to ever change our identity all the time. And so like Simba, we end up basically not knowing who we really are and just tossing our true identity away. So who are you? Let's take a look at that question. This time, not from our own perspective, but how about from God's perspective? You know, how does God see you? And verse 23 in our text reads, You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. I underline those words, born again, right? It reminds me of my baptism, right? I hope it does you too. Because you are baptized and and connected to Jesus' death and resurrection, your identity has been changed. You're changed from a sinner to a saint, from faithless to faithful, from a child of the devil to a child of God, from hell-bound to heaven-bound. You've changed from lost to found, from dead to alive. You've, You've got this, gone from this identity that always focuses on self to an identity that is is now not true to self, but true to Jesus. You've gone from an identity that's a patchwork of all these different influences and things to an identity that has one influence, Jesus. You can't pay for this identity. You can't earn this identity. It's God-given, and it's given to you freely. God sees you through his Son, Right? Your new identity isn't like that driver's license picture that you have that you hate so much, right? I know I hate mine. When my wife looked at it, she, uh, she laughed, said I looked like some kind of gangster or something in there. That's why I didn't put my picture up there. Um, God sees you as his son Jesus, right? You're picture perfect. When he looks at you, he sees the righteousness of of Christ. And so your identity is found and bound in Jesus. 
In our gospel reading for today from John chapter 8, um, Jesus was asked that question, who are you? If you go back and take a look, you'll see that, that they ask him this question, and he says, I am who I've been telling you this whole time. But of course, they didn't believe it. And so finally, he pointed them, and he said this in verse 28 of John 8. He said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. He said, you'll know my identity when you look at the cross. When you go to the cross and you see me up there, then you're going to know who I am. In fact, in the Greek, it says, then you will know that I am. Then you will know that I am God. And apart from me, I am Yahweh. Apart from me, there is no Savior. See, at the cross, as we journey with Jesus there throughout this Lenten season, when we get there, we're going to find Jesus as our substitute. We're going to find that he took our identity as sinners, and he took upon himself that punishment that we deserve as sinners. And because he did that, we learn our identity, that we're no longer seen in God's eyes as sinful people deserving of his eternal punishment. But because of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, because of what he did on that cross, we have a new identity. And if you listen to his seven words, they describe our new identity. We're forgiven, right? Paradise is ours. We're part of his family. We're never to be separated from his love in Christ again. We're never to be thirsty again, having living water. Our work of salvation is today. No matter what is going on around us, no matter what's going on in our life, we can rest in his nail-marked hands, knowing that they're loving hands, knowing that they're protective hands. Nothing can snatch us out of those hands. And this identity that you have through your baptism, through faith in Jesus, it's not temporary either. It's a changeless identity in an ever-changing world. Why? Because it's built on the imperishable seed that Peter talked about. The imperishable seed he described as the living and abiding Word of God. He then quoted from Isaiah as, uh, Mrs. Lewis shared with the children, Isaiah 40, verse 6. Um, in verse 24, Peter wrote, All flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. So that's why your identity in Christ never changes, because it's built on God's word, which remains forever. Jesus echoed that in Mark 13, 31, when he said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will pass away. When God calls you something, that is what you are. When God gives you an identity, that's who you are. Verse 25, this is the word that was preached to you. Or this is the word of the good news that was preached to you. As I mentioned, that word is described as living and abiding. God's word is living in that it is alive, it's active, it's, it makes us alive, and it's abiding in that it lives among us, it dwells inside of us, it, it remains with us. God's word engages our ever-changing lives so that we can live and grow into our baptismal identity. It's not, you know, our arguments. It's not even our lifestyle that can give new life to a believer. It's God's word. And so that's why at Bethany here, we encourage you always, we put the focus on God's word, and we say, stay connected. Stay connected through God's word. That word which is preached and taught in our classrooms each and every day where those children and their families learn of that new identity that they have through faith in Christ, and they grow up into that identity. It's preached and taught in our Sunday school classrooms, in our adult Bible studies, in our youth gatherings, in God's house, each and every time we gather here. 
God's word strengthens our identity. It, it keeps us true to who we are in Jesus. And when we fail, we hear those words, Father, forgive them. God's word not only gives us life together with God, like a vertical relationship of life together, but it also gives us life together with each other, a horizontal relationship. Verse 22 says, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. You know, if you go back and look at that verse, it talks, it has the word Philadelphia in it. It talks about brotherly love, but the word that's used there is more of a family love. But then it says, because you have this family love, it says, love one another earnestly. And that word is agape, which means the godly love, the sacrificial love that Jesus described. And so we're called um, to love one another as fellow family members of God, but we're also called not just to love one another as family, but to love one another as Jesus, as love, official love. And so this life that we have together, it's not a temporary thing. It's not until, you know, John transfers to another church. I love him until that time. It's not until, you know, Paul moves away and moves to another state. It's not until, you know, some person that's a member here passes away. This love that we have is eternal. Look around. People sitting here, right? It's God's will that we spend eternity with one another. So this love that we share now is going to go on beyond here and now into heaven. And so let's remember that. Uh, Galatians 6, 10 says, So then, we have, uh, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So do good to everyone, but we're encouraged by Paul in Galatians to love especially our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, because that love is forever. And I know COVID has affected our lives together. I know that. There are many people who are hesitant to come back due to their health conditions, and we completely understand that. Um, and many of you have um, been able to come and worship together. But we know that our life together has been hampered by this. But the goal of God and the goal of us here at Bethany is, is to have this life together, not only in mind and in spirit, but to have it in person, to have it in body, because we are the body of Christ. He wants us to not give up meeting together, but to continue to do that. So we pray that soon we'll be able to do that again without fear of, of any bodily harm. Because God wants you to share with others that sacrificial love that he has shared with you in Christ. And so we serve the family, right? We serve the family of faith, God's family, our family, um, corporately by things we do for the, for the greater good, but also individually too. We serve one another by developing relationships with each other, by getting to know one another, to learn people's needs. And then we do our best with our God-given abilities to meet those individual needs. We try to remind one another of the identity that we have. We need to be constantly reminded because the world continues to beat on us and get us to want to change that identity, to leave it behind, to forget about it. And then we try to help one another stay connected to God's Word. I want to close with uh, this passage from 1 John chapter 3. It's a beautiful passage that reminds us of our identity. It says, See what kind of love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. May you never forget it, and may you always live it. Amen.